Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the board. Thank you for your patience. I apologize. Uh, my uh, previous police board meeting went long tonight, so uh, I'm just dashing here from there. Um, Madam Committee Clerk, do we have any regrets this evening? We have no regrets. We have no regrets, okay. Uh, before we get into the meeting, I want to uh, read our, our land acknowledgement that the Oakville Public Library is situated on the Treaty Number 14 and Treaty Number 22 treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. Oakville is currently home to many different First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Regardless of where we come from, we are all interconnected through the land that we live on, the water that we use and the air that we breathe. We are committed to a continuous learning journey and allyship. We seek to elevate Indigenous voices and lived experiences to cultivate reconciliation in Oakville. Members of the board, do you have any declarations of pecuniary interest this evening to uh, disclose? I'm not seeing any. We have uh, minutes that I need to uh, bring to your attention for approval. Uh, they are the minutes from the board meeting held on March 24th, 2022. We have a set of regular minutes from the regular portion of the board meeting and also is from the confidential closed session of board. Um, would anybody like to give me a motion to approve those? Don't all jump at once. Thank you. Janet, appreciate it. Uh, seconder, please. Thank you, Susan. Comments, questions, errors, or omissions? Yes, Andrew. Um, in the regular minutes on page five, uh, there's a section which states the time that everybody joins the meeting and that it looks out of place, or I'm not sure it should be there at all, to be honest. So these are the March 24th minutes, okay. page five. Jessica, are you going to? Uh... Yeah, that's probably a system glitch with our software. I can fix that. Okay. Okay, so um, can we get a vote on the uh, approval of the minutes I, as amended? All in favor? We're back to hands, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Carried. Um, draw your attention to item number four, which is our confidential, sorry, our consent items. We have uh, three items on the consent agenda this evening. Does anybody wish to separate any of those? I'm not seeing a desire. Oh, I'm sorry, Janet. Yes. Uh, so if we could just um, separate out 4.3 for a question. 4.3 for a question. Anybody else on 4.1 or 4.2? Okay, well, let's go to 4.3 and then we'll approve them all at once. Go ahead, Janet. Um, I was just, uh, there's a comment about um, an expectation given uh, career opportunities individuals may um, may seek those um, for growth. And I just, uh, if somebody could refresh my memory, do we do it? Is there a strategy in place for those that are considered to be high performers and high potential that um, uh, we're using to mitigate the potential of that loss? So in other words, a retention strategy? We do have a retention strategy in place um, and we do have targeted individuals that we then have um, different training plans on. Um, for example, there is OLS has an Apple program, CULC has a um, public library leaders program and so we've, we've put a number of staff through through those particularly ones that have been identified as part of our retention. Um, some of the challenges that we face is of course timing. Um, so individuals feel that they're ready for that next step. We may not have that next step available. Um, and given the high level of CEO retirements over the past number of years in libraries, we're seeing um, a lot of movement, particularly in those executive level um, areas. So that's, I think, what some of that is referring to. Okay, thanks very much for clarifying. Thanks, Janet. Would you give me a motion to approve the three consent agenda items, please? Yes. Thank you. Can I get a seconder for those, please? Thank you, Stephen. Any further comments or questions on three, four, sorry, 4.1, 4.2, or 4.3? Okay, for the sake of the uh, viewing audience, I'm just going to read what they are. So 4.1 is the Oakland Public Library key agenda items. Um, 4.2 is the health and safety report. And 4.3 is employee retention and turnover metrics. These are part of our consent agenda. Generally, consent agenda items are routine in nature and don't require discussion or debate. Our members of the board have read all of these uh, uh, matters in detail, and uh, we had one question with respect to 4.3. I'll call the question. All in favor of the approval of those three items, please signify. 
Thank you very much. That those are approved, and the or, the actions on all three of those are for receipt only. No action. We have no con confidential consent items per item five. We move on to item six, which is discussion items, and six point one. You'll find on page eighteen to forty of your agenda is the Oakville Public Library audit findings report. And who do we have leading us on that? Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Um, we have not in the agenda, not in the printed agenda, but in eScribe, we have an item 4.4, .4, which is the uh, procedure bylaws retention committee. It's only viewable in eScribe. It's not in the printed copy. Right, and I'm dealing with the printed copy. Right. Okay. So we do need a motion for that. Okay. So 4.4 .4 is, I'm sorry, I don't have the agenda item here. What is it? It's the bylaws. Point of order. Yes. Um, I believe um, we approved all of the minutes uh, simultaneously. Did we know it? We approved the minutes, but there's an item 4.4, .4 and I did not call the 4.4, .4, so I need to. Deal I with thought that, that was included. Okay. No. So this is the this is the minutes of the Oakville Public um, Library ad hoc procedure board bylaws review committee. The minutes okay. of April 14th. Thank you, um, Andrew. Perhaps you'll give me a motion to approve those. Moved. Thank you. Can I get a seconder, please? Thank you, uh, Pankage. Um, any comments or questions? All in favor? Thank you. Those are approved. Sorry about that. I, I'm working from a paper agenda tonight because eScribe is not working on the workstation I'm in front of. Uh, so as I said before, we're going to go back to 6.1, which is the 2021 Oakville Public Library Audit Findings Report. So who is leading us on this journey? Good evening. I, I will be leading that journey. I hear somebody talking, but I see nobody on so I'm just getting my camera started. Okay, terrific. Apologies, it's still saying right now that it, I need to ask for permission to start the video. Hi, Jade. I keep clicking the button that says ask um, participant to start video, so I don't know if you have to accept that. And I have, yes. Hmm. Okay. So maybe at this time uh, I'll start. Um, apologies, I'll continue to try to get the video going here in a minute. Uh, and good evening and thank you for the opportunity to join me tonight. My name is Jade Surgener and I'm a member of the town's finance team. I've been invited to speak about two motions before you this evening. So item 6.1 and 6.2 on the agenda. And I'm actually hoping to speak, uh, switch up the order a bit and speak first about 6.1, which is the, or 6.2, which is the 2021 financial statements. And I'll highlight a couple of items for you as a board. And then after this, I'll introduce the library's external auditors, KPMG, to present their audit findings for the 2021 year end. So in, in terms of item 6.2 on the agenda and the recommendation before you to approve the 2021 financial statements, the staff report contains much of the relevant information for the financial statements, but there are a few items that I'd like to touch on briefly. The first is to highlight that KPMG is prepared to provide the library with an unqualified or clean audit opinion. And shortly, Carlos will walk us through how they came up with that audit opinion and the various aspects of their audit. But as an organization and, and what's important to the board is that it is a, a clean audit opinion, which means that the, the processes and controls can be relied on, which is, is always a good thing that, that should give you comfort. And then I also wanted to highlight that these financial statements are prepared in accordance with the public sector accounting standards, which is a different presentation than the operating variance reports that you're used to seeing quarterly. So note six to the financial statements reconciles these differences uh, between how we budget for operating purposes and then the requirements under the accounting standards. And this note highlights these impacts, which is mainly items related to the capital assets. And the operating budget considers the purchase of the library's collection as an in-year expense, but then for the accounting standards, the collection is set up as an asset and then recognized as an expense over its useful life. So it's just a different method of presentation. And so because of this reconciliation with the Q4 information, which Belinda would have covered in a lot more detail at a previous meeting, I won't be going through all the details of the revenue and expenses. 
I just wanted to highlight the reconciliation to, to draw the connection between the two methods uh, that are both right, they just have their own purposes. The last item I wanted to bring your attention to is that the change in how we treat the surplus repayment to the town. And so historically, the library has always repaid any surpluses in the subsequent year. And so what I mean by this is in 2020, we would, would have repaid 2019 surplus. And so the change that we have for 2021 and, and going forward is that we have aligned this to occur in the year the financial statements are being approved. So the 2021 financial statements reflect that the 2021 surplus has been repaid. And this will allow more consistency each year in net, um, net assets and accumulated surplus. So you, we won't see the fluctuation based on prior year results and the timing of the repayments. And the other reason why we made this change was to align with how we would treat deficits. So if the library had a deficit, the deficit would need to be funded in year to balance to zero. And so this change has aligned us with best practices and to ensure we're having consistent treatment for accounting purposes for both surpluses and deficits. So everything will be recognized in year going forward. And those are the items that I wanted to discuss briefly, but before I turn it over to KPMG, I just wanted to pause to see if anyone has any questions on the financial statements. I don't see any. Please proceed. Great, thank you. So joining us this evening from KPMG is Carlos Alvarez. Carlos is a partner with KPMG and on the engagement and we'll be able to speak to the audit findings report and any, answer any questions that you may have on this year's audit process. Thank you, Jade. And I, I did get my video to work. So uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Carlos Alvarez, uh, audit partner with KPMG, uh, as well as auditing the, the library board. I'm also the auditor on the, the main town of Oakville and other uh, affiliated Oakville files. So I will walk you through the audit findings report for 2021, and certainly understanding that this document would have been pre-circulated. Uh, I will focus in on the items that are most significant and most material. Uh, the town clerk, uh, you, you may wish to show this on screen, otherwise I'll just refer to the page numbers uh, that are embedded in the audit findings report. And where I would like to begin is on page four we, of the we, audit. Sorry, can we pause for a second? Can we get these, the presentation up because it's- Hi. Hi, Carlos, I didn't receive a presentation. Oh, I have it here. Let me see if I have the technical capabilities to do so. I can sorry, it is the PDF document. Um, it would have been uh, distributed in advance. It's not a PowerPoint? Correct. Is it just what's in the agenda? It is, yes. Okay, give me a minute. It's not in there. I'll have to share it. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, if you turn a few pages into page four, and the page numbers are on the bottom right uh, of each page, just by way of executive summary, uh, we are substantially complete in terms of the audit process. Uh, the items that are listed outstanding on the left-hand side of the slide are very customary to where we expect to be at at this point in the audit process. In terms of comparing how we executed the audit, uh, there were no changes whatsoever 
uh, as compared to the audit plan that we originally set uh, at the onset. From a misstatement perspective, uh, there were no corrected or uncorrected misstatements. So further to uh, Jade's comments, uh, it was a very clean audit. Our audit report that is included in your package is a clean audit report uh, with no reservations whatsoever. In terms of the underlying accounting policies and accounting practices, uh, there were no changes in the policies from 2020 to fiscal 2021. And also in terms of a byproduct of the audit, we always look at you know, whether or not there are any control deficiencies and there are no deficiencies uh, to bring forward uh, to your attention. It is always very important for external auditors to comment on independence. Uh, we do various projects uh, for the uh, town overall. We have not provided any services that would threaten our independence as external auditors. Moving forward to the next slide. Just as a refresher in terms of materiality, uh, we do set our materiality threshold at the beginning of the audit, which I, as you see on this screen is, is currently set at uh, approximately $300,000. Individually, that is a large number in relation to your financial statements. We have a much lower tolerance for audit differences, and that was approximately $15,000. Moving along to the next slide, page number six. Within Canada, there are two risks that I'm required to discuss uh, with those charged with governance uh, being yourselves. And one is associated with the risk of fraudulent revenue recognition. And the other risk is associated with the risk of management override. We are mandated under our Canadian auditing standards to respond to these two risks in our audit file. Uh, the first one is outlined uh, on this page and the second one on page seven. Based on all of our procedures, we can report uh, to all of you that we have not uncovered any suspected, alleged, or, act or actual acts of fraud. And one of the main uh, audit tools that we do as part of the audit is by looking at a sample of manual journal entries, just to make sure that the, uh, that the rationale and the business uh, reason for the entry makes sense with the operations that you operate. And again, uh, no findings to note. So we can skip ahead to page number eight. In terms of getting into some of the nuts and bolts of the audit, uh, we had uh, full access to the management team, uh, full cooperation. Uh, we were able to receive all of the supporting documentation to support uh, all of the uh, balances included in the financial statements. This slide you know, simply presents some of the audit procedures that we performed during the audit. One item of note, uh, as it pertains to the post-employment benefit liabilities, this is a actuarially determined number uh, for 2022. The library will have to go out and get a full valuation as a full valuation is required every three years. So that third year will be coming up in fiscal 2022. Moving along to page number nine. Again, just in terms of some of the other areas of focus, uh, investments, uh, the operating expenses and tangible capital assets. Uh, again, uh, through all of our testing, uh, there, were no, there were no misstatements, uh, no items that were unreconciled and no reportable findings uh, to bring to your attention. Moving along to slide number 10. From a disclosure standpoint, uh, we as auditors are satisfied that these financial statements have all of the disclosures that are required under the accounting standard. And if you were to line these financial statements up with the previous year, um, the majority of the notes would be identical, both in terms of format, but also in terms of wording. Moving along to the next slide. Uh, just to validate my earlier comment in terms of misstatements, uh, you can see here on this slide that it is a, a clean report uh, with no adjustments that are noted on this slide. Moving along to page number 12. 
Within the appendices, my plan is not to go through each one in detail, but the draft audit report, again, is a clean audit report. We will ask your management team to sign what we call a management representation letter. I, I do find that letter to be uh, very important because it outlines management's responsibility in the preparation of these financial statements. These are not the financial statements of KPMG. These are the financial statements of the Oakville Library. And that letter does a good job in terms of separating uh, the accountabilities of management versus the auditor. The very last appendix, uh, hopefully it'll work. Um, it does provide some links, just some educational tools uh, as a leave behind. And the only other comment that I would like to make to all of you is just around cybersecurity. Yes, we did a financial statement audit. That does not include a cybersecurity audit. And the only reason why I bring up cybersecurity is because it is a top three topic in every council meeting, every audit committee, and every board meeting. Certainly, you know, the library board uh, in Oakville you know, purchases services and uses services from the main town. I'm only here to make the comment that the importance of cybersecurity is continuing to increase. And uh, certainly I welcome, you know, any discussions, you know, throughout 2022 and, and beyond on, um, on how we can support you um, in this area. But certainly, I just want to make everyone aware that it is one of those top three areas for all organizations, uh, irrespective of size. So with that, I will pause. I would say those are the formal topics uh, that I wanted to bring forward to your attention. Thank you. Members of the board, are there questions? Uh, Stephen. Well, I, I just want to reiterate the, the point of cybersecurity. You may have seen the superintendent of OSPI gave a keynote speech today in which he spoke to the annual report they released two days ago where cybersecurity is one of seven risks that they identified. So I could not agree more. And I'm, as everyone knows, not an IT expert in any way, shape or form myself. But when the superintendent of OSPI, as is behooves the office, is talking about this, um, um, in addition to the report, in addition to what we just heard tonight, I just reiterate the importance of that and, and certainly hope and I assume and trust that it's being looked at uh, at, at the appropriate levels at the town and, and the library, but uh, this risk is only going to be going up. So ironically, we had a report on this at the uh, Police Services Board today as well. Um, quite a frightening uh, prediction for the future in terms of how it's going to increase. Um, I guess that's a question to you, Tara. How are we, I, I assume that our ISNS department at the town are responsible for that piece? Yeah, they are. I do know, um, and Colleen, um, if she's on, may be able to speak to this a bit more. Um, I do believe that ITS is either has hired or is about to hire um, a cybersecurity designated position um, as part of that. I will say also that earlier, in the year, um, ITS mandated that all staff have to do three hours of cyber training, cybersecurity training. Um, so we're in the process of rolling that out um, to all staff in our organization. Um, we hope that will be complete um, by mid-June. Um, we started with those with the most um, risk. Um, so our leadership team, those with access, our mobile phones, um, financials, and then we're rolling it out to staff with lower risk. Okay, thank you for that. Um, any further questions for uh, our auditor? Uh, Pankage. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see yeah. your hand up there. I apologize. Go okay. ahead. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Carlos, you mentioned that uh, the library will be required to do a full actuarial evaluation for uh, this coming year or this year for their um, uh, post-employment benefits. Note three, however, states that um, there was an actual evaluation done as of December 31st, 2021. Was that not a full valuation and just a, an actuarial report? Or what was that then? Correct. Uh, so a, there, there's a full valuation report in every three years. Right. In the intervening periods, the actuaries do what's known in the industry as extrapolations. Yeah. And as part of those extrapolations, they generally issue reports, but it's it's not the the full actuarial evaluation report, which means actually refreshing 
all of the headcount metrics, yeah. uh, age demographics, and all the underlying data that goes into a full valuation. Yeah, no, I, I figured that. It's just I was thrown off a bit by the line that says the post-employment benefit obligation was determined by an actuarial valuation as at December 31, 2021. It seems to suggest they've done they've done a full valuation, but obviously not. Yeah, I I, I could go back to to management and just uh, double check that it's if it's if it's more suited to put in the word extrapolation, if that if that more appropriately describes the report as opposed right. to a full valuation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pankage. Further questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Okay, members of the board, our action here is we have two reports to approve. Um, 6.2 we dealt with first, so we'll vote on that one first. That is the recommendation that the draft financial statements of the Oakville Public Library for the year ending December 31st, 2021 be approved. Can I get a motion to uh, approve those, please? Thank you, Pankage. Seconded by. Thank you, Susan. Any further questions or comments? Stephen? Or you're just about ready to vote? Okay, you're, you're ahead of me. Uh, all in favor? Okay, the, uh, that's carried and those are approved. 6.1 is the audit findings report. That's the uh, report that we just had a, um, uh, a recap of. And this is a receipt for information only. So I need a motion to receive this. Thank you, Pankage again. And seconded by Andrew, thank you very much. Further comments or questions? Not seeing any, I'll call the question. All in favor? That is received. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, our friends at KPMG for another um, year of uh, work. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Moving on to 6.3, it's our OPL procedural bylaws uh, report and I guess our new bylaw. Andrew, do you want to uh, provide an overview and summary of our work? Um, yeah, I'm actually just going to introduce it briefly. So um, sure. uh, Bill, Councillor Noel, and I uh, form the bylaw review committee. Um, uh, along with Tara and Christina, who helps us with recording minutes. Um, so we went through the bylaws. There were some remarks that we uh, we took from the board as a whole, and we also looked through everything else as well and made a few a few fine tuning adjustments. So I'm going to turn it over to Tara to walk through some of those specific changes, um, and then any of us, of course, can address any questions from the board. But these are being brought forward uh, for the full board to approve. Tara, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, if the board um, turns to the report on the under the comments, um, I provided a list of key areas that have been updated for the board. Um, we did clean up language where appropriate, but I didn't necessarily summarize those here because the overall purpose of those statements remained the same. These are ones where we actually um, the the committee um, is proposing changes that would have impacts. Um, so just to touch on some of them. Um, the first one is the clarification of the board recruitment process. So actually tying it to the clerk's process, which is what we follow. So just making sure that that alignment is clear. Um, clarification on the timing of the election of the chair and vice chair, um, as well as that the positions are for the length of the board term. I think in there, we also had that they could be elected for annu annually or for the length of the term. It's been our practice through the length of the term. So we just cleaned up that language. Um, the requirement for a board meeting to be held uh, within 30 days of an executive committee meeting. Um, you'll also see there was an option also for virtual attendance. Um, as part of that, uh, following this meeting, um, for those of you who aren't aware, council returned to chambers um, for council meetings earlier in the week. Um, so I will be meeting with the clerk's department uh, in the coming weeks to talk about um, what the process is for the board to return to in-person. So I'll keep you updated to that. Um, however, we did include, the, the committee felt it was important to include an option um, for up the potential of a hybrid meeting where possible. Um, something that is traditionally found in other uh, bylaws was a board assessment section. So we added in some wording on that to expand on if it gets approved. Um, and then we just basically cleaned up a lot of the, um, the different committees. So the CEO performance evaluation committee and the audit committee um, are now essentially committees of the whole. That's been the practice um, for the past number of years. So that's what we actually put in the bylaws um, in order to just align all of that. Um, and as well, we, we just revisited the financial um, 
and human resources impacts, um, mentioning the impact that the MOU and the SLAs have. Um, again, trying to connect all our governing documents together. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. I know that the um, committee will be happy to, to discuss why um, we're looking at these items. Thanks, Tara. Um, are there any questions from the board? Janet. Councillor House at the Um, so a few follow-ups, um, just uh, in terms of the uh, requirement for a board meeting to be held within 30 days of an executive um, committee meeting, how did you land on 30 days um, uh, as the time frame? Yeah, fair question. And, and we debated because, you know, initially we wondered if it should be within two weeks. Uh, we recognize the fact that, that in most cases we've got this meeting occurring almost every month. So you know, in most cases, um, this will be the next logical time to have a meeting required to uh, to affirm any decisions uh, that the executive committee has taken. With that said, there is a provision already, uh, you know, for any two board members to call a special meeting if necessary of the entire board. So there's sort of that, um, you know, escape lane if we need it for an urgent meeting. Um, you know, if that's to be driven by another board member, but other than that, 30 days seem to capture that we'd be able to deal with uh, any executive committee decisions at this uh, regular meeting. Okay, so um, thank you. That was well explained. Thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, was there a discussion about emergency management procedures? Um, there was, again, the you know, with the executive committee, I mean, you know, I think the basically what we came down to is if you've got the uh the chair and the vice chair and they can't agree on something as it is then we would need to potentially call a special meeting of the whole board regardless so um you know trying to enumerate all of the possibilities of you know what emergencies might arise and how to deal with them and the timelines associated with that seem to be you know more of an exercise in in, in adding uh complexity to this instead of just addressing the matter at hand which is that if we've got you know, an appointed chair and vice chair on the executive committee to take decisions under urgent situations. And then that's the role. If they can't agree, the rest of the board remains ready. Okay, so um, I guess I'd just like to comment a bit on that. Um, yes. And this is doesn't speak to individuals, it just speaks to process. Mm -hmm. um, we just went through a, um, and it looks like we're still going through, um, a pretty rocky time and at the time when uh, the triggers had to be pulled to put us uh, into uh, emergency services and situations, um, I know that a lot of decisions had to be made um, quite quickly. And I can appreciate that we have, um, uh, you know, we entrust in the chair and the vice chair uh, the ability to respond quite quickly um, to a, a need. I do have a concern having experienced it, um, and it's not relative to necessarily the library board, um, that the transparency of what decisions are gonna be made on behalf of the library board are clearer. Um, and where the control lies, if we end up in a true um, emergency management situation, I'm not, I mean, we're talking, you know, pandemic type situations. We basically handed over control to the town um, uh, for all the decision-making relative to uh, how the board would proceed. And I'm in no way suggesting that, um, you know, Tara wasn't actively integrated and Colleen is always amazing and being a part of the executive committee is, is valuable. But I do think, and I, and I go back to um, what Chair Noel did when we spent the time to talk about the library board is an independent board. Um, and we have a duty to the board, not just the town, those of us that are, are members of the uh, uh, of council. So I'm just, I'm, I do get concerned that 30 days could go by. And, and I do think there is an opportunity to be a bit more prescriptive about, um, or a fulsome group discussion about what are the responsibilities we're prepared to hand off and in what circumstances. Um, and if everybody's good with, okay, well, we're just gonna go, um, at least let's have that discussion. Uh, there were decisions being made that, um, uh, you know, 
we needed to be more transparent about. I'm not sure the public realized uh, who made those decisions. Those are all fair comments. I mean, to to address the the current situation, I mean, yes, the executive committee acted quickly, but then those um, those decisions were affirmed by a meeting of the whole board subsequently. Um, you know, in the in the current context, I mean, yes, uh, having Tara join the you know um, kind of fall under the uh, overview of the the town for the for the situation made sense due to the nature of the emergency, which was a public health emergency. Again, if we're going to, you know, go through uh, trying to enumerate every possible kind of urgent situation that might arise, I mean, you know, it would be it would be quite an exercise. But but I think we do need at some point to rely on the the judgment of the chair and vice chair and the executive committee, and then again, you know, the fallback, which is that any two board members can call for a special meeting of the entire board if we need to affirm or refute any of those decisions. So I I think that works. If there's something that I'm you know, not considering, I'd, I'd, I'd absolutely love to hear more. And we could certainly review this uh, again. I guess I would look to, is there gonna be a discussion across the board on this or is the, the to the chair, how do you, how do you, how do you wanna handle the discussion on this? Because well, I, I, I would have some follow-up questions. I guess the, I mean, the appropriate way to address it would be uh, if you have a, an alternative proposal is to perhaps put the proposal on the table. And if you don't wanna do it formally, you could you could pitch your idea that we can discuss it. Right now, the, the, um, the proposal is what the committee is putting forward at the moment, um, but the appropriate, it's pr appropriate to have that conversation. Do you have a specific recommendation? That you'd like to um, that you'd like to advance. Um, well, I, I what I had thought was going to come back was a more of a uh, a paragraph statement that says our emergency management procedures uh, include the following, um, and the chair and the vice chair have uh, this authority. However, I, 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 stating what Andrew said, two committee members can two board members can call a meeting, uh, and uh, that that decisions relative to um, uh, decision, uh, you know, closure of the facilities um, uh, and uh, are, are, are brought to the board, you know, in a, in a more timely way than 30 days. I'm sorry, but I think 30 is a long time. Sure, I guess, well, I'll, I'll throw my two cents worth in. I mean, the reality is, is that if you take the, the last, and only emergency that we've dealt with um, as a board, um, as an example. I mean, we we quickly met um, as an, an executive committee, and we I think it was pretty quick thereafter. We had a board meeting, so I think that it, what we we you know I think that the best judgment of the um, staff and the the executive committee were you know was um, exercised in in a timely fashion. Um, you know, we had not we had not you know experienced this before however you know we made a decision based on the recommendations from a our staff at the library and b the owners of all of our buildings you know who had some concerns about keeping the rec centers and such open uh and that decision was made um the board ratified it in relatively short order i think the thing is that you know and one of the things that was going through my mind is if you if you're in the midst of an emergent situation um, you know, to prescribe a shorter period of time, I think could put pressure on the board, can put pressure on the staff, can put pressure on everybody when they're attempting to, you know, deal with the situation that's in front of them. Um, the first 30 days of the pandemic was pandemonium, as you can recall. Um, we were dealing with a whole range of things, including our own families and our emotions and our businesses and everything else. So, you know, trying to call a meeting, trying to prescribe a meeting be held within four or five or six days, I think is a little, in my opinion, I think it'd be a little difficult. Um, you know, I've tried to call meetings like that in the past and they've never, it's sometimes not been possible to get quorum. So I'm comfortable with the way that it is personally, uh, having experienced it directly. Uh, you know, I, I think that one of the, one of the issues is of course, you know, we handed over, we ceded control largely to uh, a delegated authority to the CAO of the town. And, you know, in, in, a, in a different circumstance where we were in, you know, in control of our own facilities, et cetera, that might be, a different, might be a different decision. But the reality was is that notwithstanding the fact that we have our own CEO, um, 
all of our facilities, and that was the biggest picture, the biggest issue here was access to facilities due to the closures and the requirement of closures. All of those facilities are managed by the municipality uh, and owned by the municipality. So in my opinion at the time, I, th I thought the best decision was to leave it to um, the, you know, the central decision-making authority that both council um, and you know, our board ultimately decided to, to, uh, um, to empower. Again, if we, if we were a library system that owned our own buildings and we were more independent, that might be a different, it might be a different scenario. Tara was certainly qualified and remains qualified to make you know, some of those decisions had we um, delegated the authority to her. But in light of the circumstances, I felt that the recommendation was best. So I guess it boils down to this, that our experience, I think we managed it well. Um, I think there's enough safeguards in there to make sure that uh, we can expedite the process. Um, uh, you know, the petitioning by any two board members to get a meeting, so that could literally mean a meeting could be held within a couple days. Uh, if that was, if there was a concern amongst the board. So I, I think A, you know, um, our experience was positive under similar rules. B, um, you know, there are the, there are those safeguard provisions. If the board just vehemently disagrees, they can get that meeting organized even sooner than the 30 days. Um, and C, we're in just different circumstances. While we are independent, we are, our own, we are a board of trustees that oversees the operations of the libraries. We don't control our own buildings. So this, a lot of those decisions were not in our hands. If the landlord says, and the, you know, even before the province said, but if the landlord says you can't open, you can't open. Um, you know, in this case, it was the province that ultimately made the decisions, but it was the town that was managing it. So those are my two cents worth on this particular issue. I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, emotionally cleaved to this position. I mean, I could be persuaded otherwise if, if there was an interest, it's not something I'm you know, going to, going to uh, this isn't a hill I'm going to die on or even become injured on. It's simply, a, um, it's just simply my, my viewpoint from being, using another war metaphor, in the trenches on this particular one uh, as one of the members of the executive committee. Any other comments? Uh, Stephen. And then we'll come, let's go with Stephen, then we'll go to Colleen. Want to add one? And sorry, it's, it's breaking up a little bit. I don't know if that's me or 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 any. So I apologize if I'm talking over anybody. But um, one of the things, Jen, I, I hear what you're saying, and one of the things that I think is is important. Jeff and I have a very good working relationship. I know where he lives. He, he's a little like five minutes away from here. And more to the point, when this came up, he called me. I was in the car. I took the call immediately. Um, and several years ago, when we were dealing with something. I was in Rio and he called me and I called him back and we had a, a close call, uh, a very good call. My point simply being, I'm not standing again, as everyone knows. I think that I think perhaps one of the important parts here is that the chair and vice chair, whoever they may be, make sure they have a good relationship with each other. And then, of course, with everyone else. And in this case, I think Jeff and I do have a good relationship, but I'm certainly alive to what everyone's hearing and I apologize. I missed last month because I was, I was down and out with uh, with COVID. But um, I'm I'm alive to all this. I just want to kind of reiterate that the chair and vice chair do have a very good working relationship, uh, and we can turn things on a dime prudently, I think. And we've ha we have some experience in so doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Colleen, you had some comments. I just wanted to add with respect to um, the whole issue of of the town and decision making that there's, there's two important pieces to remember uh, and to ensure that is carefully reflected in the, the bylaws. One is that uh, Tara, like the CEO of the OPL must always be a member of the Emergency Operations Command Center because that allows the CEO an opportunity to advocate on behalf of the library and, and bring forward the issues to, of the library to the emergency response team, because that's where all, uh, all planning, all responses start. So I think that's, uh, and, and then we send the recommendations to the CAO. So it's, it's a, um, a team up uh, process, not a CAO down to the EOC. That's not generally how it works. And the, I think the other piece that's also really important is because the OPL um, also sits on the Community Services Commission um, leadership team, which is the commission that is responsible for the overall response to any emergency. Uh, it 
it affords her a different uh, level of influence. So for example, uh, when we started, we actually started planning for the pandemic uh, January 29th, which was several weeks before. Because Tara was part of community services, Tara was part of that early planning, the discussions, um, when we started to look at, okay, so what, are, what does it look like for the critical public services that people uh, are gonna be concerned about? The library was already at the table. So I think those two pieces are, are really important because they, Tara's role on both those bodies uh, provides key influence in terms of town decision-making. And so it, it becomes a much more collaborative process as a result. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Colleen. Notwithstanding the fact that uh, the other piece of, of what Colleen's talking about is that the library was able to play a critical function in coordinating with other services and providing services to the town. So there was a, there was a net benefit uh, to the overall citizens and having that central coordination of, of resources. Um, anyway, uh, for the comments, back to Janet. Oh, sorry, Colleen, so, did you want to say something else to that? Is that did I, did... Colleen, were you trying to say something else and I cut you off? The one other thing that, that I would highlight um, that was really important is the library was really impacted from an operational standpoint by changes that were um, it put in place through provincial regulation. Um, having the connection to the town allowed them to piggyback on a lot of the policy development pieces that had to be done on the fly, to be quite honest. Yep. You know, we had never dealt with these types of issues before, so we were writing policy constantly and it, it allowed Tara to determine what parts of those policies applied to the library and what didn't, as opposed to having to start right from scratch while you're trying to deal with what your operational response is. So I think that's, that uh, the OPL really benefited from having another group uh, at least do the drafts for the policy and then she could just decide how she wanted to edit them or, or what elements worked for her. Thank you. I apologize, Janet. I'll come back to you now. I, I, I didn't mean to cut off Colleen to come to you, so you're up. It's okay. I just, I, I, I wanted to just us to have this discussion. Um, so as I said at the beginning, this isn't about individuals yeah. and it isn't even about um, how, um, how great a lot of the decision was. I'm looking at a document that's supposed to lead us through uh, and give us clarity as board members. And we will have potentially new board members and they should understand what uh, what we've just talked about, which is that not only is she uh, the CEO, a member of the commission, but uh, the Community Services Commission um, and the senior management, but she would sit on the emergency, whatever that phrase is. I don't see that in this document. Um, and I didn't see in the document as well. Um, uh, any clarity around seating control. Um, and um, I think those are the words that make me a tiny bit nervous. Um, um, so for example, I, I, I would not disagree that we all benefited from a collaborative um, structured approach to how we are gonna manage through closures, masking, distancing, PPEs, all of that. Um, but one example that comes to mind for me is by virtue of doing that, um, while we are very proud of a lot of the services that the library um, uh, was able to put in place, they weren't allowed to loan out. Our CEO did not have approval to loan out um, uh, the printers that would allow mass shield, uh, shields to be created. Um, it was not a decision within her hands. Um, and my understanding is other libraries have independence. So, you know, what was done was done and there were other solutions to getting face shields and other people stepped into that fray, but it just raised for me, I certainly didn't have clarity when I looked at all the minutes and uh, the details, what could or could not be done and what was the responsibility of the CEO versus um, the Emergency Management Committee. Um, and so I just, I think we're, it's incumbent on us as a board to have a document that has that, a little bit more of that detail there. So it's clear. And if we're all good with it, that's great. But, you know, times change and relationships change. 
And the document is what lives on it and is the guiding force to the next time we have to face something like this. So I guess my ask is, um, you know, I thought 30, I, I will say, I think 30 still is too long because we can have a virtual meeting in 14 days and, and, uh, and at least be informed and, and confirm our commitment would be one request I'd have of a change. But the other is just, can we come back to this with just a little bit more precision around uh, the role of the CEO um, uh, in an emergency management situation? I think we owe it to, 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 uh, to, to learn from what we've been through. And with that, I will be quiet. Kara, did you have comment? Um, yeah, I mean, my, through the chair, of course, um, the board, I guess, you know, maybe one of the best options is for me to take that away and look where the most appropriate place for it to be, um, because we have different options. So we could look at adding a section to the bylaw, although if you want it to speak to my role um, in EOC, that might be better off in the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, where it specifies my role with town SMT um, and the different areas there. So um, it may not, this refers specifically to the board, not necessarily my role. Um, so we can look at, I can look at options for maybe some, some added wording, like a section in here that just maybe summarizes some of the other pieces um, and then look at maybe the, MOU where we might be able to adjust to kind of to bring those together um, is an yeah, option. That, it's a good point, and and I think that um, I think that you may be onto something in terms of the, where the appropriate place is for uh, for the refinement because this is the procedural bylaw. It ultimately guides yeah. the board and their activities, not the CEO. No. Um, that would be in in other documentation. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, my suggestion would be I'm not I'm not um, I'm not um, I'm moved by the argument from our colleague, um, but now that I give it some thought, I, I think that the appropriate place for that is in uh, a document that has more relevance to uh, specifically the CEO's role uh, as it pertains to, and I guess that would be in the M. Which would would it be in the SLA or the? Um, my role and connection with the town is in the MOU, yeah. um, but I can review all of them and then bring back where I think it's most appropriate because it, it may be in, in I, it's been a while since I've read the MOU, but I do know that it speaks to me being part of the senior management team of the town. Um, I think it speaks to my relationship with Colleen. Yeah. Um, so we can flesh that out a bit more. How for do you sure. feel about that, Janet, as a, as a uh, compromise and as a way to move forward? It may actually it may actually be a better place to focus all of this 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 discussion on. So I like the suggestion um, uh, because it does add the precision. I still would 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 ask the board to consider and the committee to consider going to fifteen days. Um, in an emergency to, to uh, sure. advise the board. Well, it's not for the community to decide, it's for, for, for the board to decide. So you, you're, you're certainly well within your, your, um, your rights and I would have no problem supporting a 15 day uh, time frame. Andrew, you had a question or comment? Um, I just want to, uh, to state that I agree that the description of the CEO's role would be better in the MOU or the SLA for sure. Um, I think, I mean, I'm supportive of the, of the 30 days personally um, but I am happy to go with whatever the board as a whole agrees with. So I don't know, um, Chair Noel, if it's, you know, do we move the adoption as is and then we can move an amendment to, uh, to modify that Yeah, to, 15 versus 30 days on its own and decide that and then resolve the whole question? Yeah, so to, to make my Robert's Rules heart swell, I, what I would prefer <laughs> that we do at this point, I have actually something I want to raise as well, um, but I would suggest we move and second, the, the, the proposal from the committee is the appropriate way to deal with it. And then we can deal with any off uh, one-offs on from amendments to the motion. I think that's the best way and the cleanest way to deal with it. So let's, mm -hmm. I, I will ask for a motion to approve the, uh, uh, the recommendations contained on uh, the, the report, which includes the adoption of the bylaw as well as the, uh, um, as well as the uh, approval of the, the new procedural bylaw. Um, so can I get that motion and somebody to second it, please? Notwithstanding how you feel about the other piece, let's just get it on the floor and then we can we can uh, deal with the other piece of an amendment. I'm going to come to Janet and ask her to make an amendment. Um, is there a seconder to that? Please be your seconder. Thank you. Pancake. 
Now, Janet, do you want to make a motion to change 30 to 15? Yes. Okay. Can I get a seconder to that, please? Thank you, Bill. Okay. So that's on the floor. Um, do you want to speak any more to that, Janet? No. Okay. Um, I'll just make a last comment. I mentioned it earlier. I'm, I have no issue with 15 over 30. Uh, I think that, you know, there's, there's lots of flexibility um, in terms of, of calling these meetings. And, and if that gives, um, if that gives uh, the board um, more comfort in terms of the uh, approval process, then I have no issue with that. I don't think 30, 15 days would have given us any greater um, challenge. Um, but then again, I don't think 30 days e does either because, we, again, we can call a meeting sooner than that. So 30 was just an outside target. But I'll, I'm happy to support it. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a reasonable a reasonable approach, so that's my two cents. Anybody else want to speak to it? Okay, I'll call the question on the on the amendment only. We're not dealing with the rest of the uh, any other potential amendments. I'll call the question on the amendment of uh, 30 to 15 days. All in favor? Okay, that carries. Thank you. Um, okay, anything further? I have one, but I'll I'll go through. I'll I'll talk to. Uh, I'll ask you folks first before I, I raise mine. Seen none. Um, so this is more of a question. Perhaps I, I did I miss a did I miss a, a meeting? Did I miss a did I miss a committee meeting? No. Oh, okay. I thought we were going to eliminate the term limit. It is it is supposed to be gone. No, it's still there. It's not in your summary, and it's and it's actually in the document two point four. Unless this is a paper copy issue again. <laughs> Oh, no, because yeah, because I sent out because I missed that in my key items, and I sent it out um, okay. to the board that 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 should be fixed. That did we we did remove that? Did that somehow get put back in? Okay. My apologies if it did. We were working on five so, different versions. So Andrew, that was the recommendation from the committee, correct? Just give me one moment, please. Sure. I'm just scrolling to that. It's two point. It's two point four. Yeah, so there, Jeff, the Appendix A has um, has the original version, and then Appendix B has the updated version, which is more concise in 2.4. So it reads, board members shall hold office for a term concurrent with the term of council or until a successor is appointed. I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, there's two versions in this document? Yeah, there's the, the original, and then there's an updated, and then an updated clean oh, one. Oh, then I apologize. I, I'm totally messed up because I can't get onto Dillatrust. None of my notes are here. I apologize for that. Okay, I take that back. It, it's, sorry, Chair? Yes, Bill? Andrew. J just to ask if anyone else was clear on that, are there any other questions? Because Appendix B, Appendix B is actually the updated version. Yep. Appendix A just has the old version with some highlights. So it's on page 100 is the updated if you want to take a look at the wording. Yeah, if there are any other questions, now's the time. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I'll ask again, does anybody wish to discuss any more aspects of the uh, committee's recommendations? I'm not seeing any. So I, I'm going to, uh, it's been moved and seconded, and I'm going to uh, uh, call the question on the amended motion because the previous amendment uh, was approved. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Good work. Thank you very much to Andrew. Uh, thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, I know you put a lot of work into it. You did a great job chairing the meetings and uh, we really appreciate your help on, on getting this done. And thank you, Bill, for your um, expert uh, expertise and uh, uh, diligence on dealing with these items as well. It was a fun meeting with the two of you and working together. Um, if I may, Chernel, uh, thank you, especially to Tara as well, who actually did a lot of the hard work <laughs> in terms of making the updates. <laughs> Much appreciated. No problem. It's what they pay me the big bucks for. Not so much. Uh, okay, we're moving on to 6.4, that is Staff Development Day, and that the recommendation is that the Staff Development Day report be received for information and that the request to close all library branches on September 23rd 2022 to support a library staff development day be approved. Tara, do you want to uh, give us a high level Absolutely. update on this? Um, so the board will remember back in 2019, we brought uh, our first request to close the full system for a day in order to bring together all staff um, for a team building as well as an educational day. Um, the idea um, at 
in 2019 was that it would be an annual kind of occurrence. 2020 hit, got a little sidetracked. 2021, sidetrack kind of continued. Um, and now we're back to 2022. Um, and there's been a lot of changes uh, to the library and the world in general. And so we think it's really important to reintroduce the Staff Development Day. We're targeting September, um, looking at COVID patterns over the past two years. We're really hopeful that September will be a good month. Um, going into the fall will be interesting. Um, and that uh, we'll be able to really spend some time digging into the new strategic plan um, as well as some, some issues um, and, and training options that we can do for all staff at the same time. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions about this? Janet? Are you moving it? So I think, yeah, okay. I, I think it's great that you're, uh, you're, you're, you're valiantly moving forward to get this uh, accomplished this year. Um, just, uh, I, I'd be pleased to move it. The only... Um, sort of operational question I have is uh, verification of uh, uh, how it affects um, uh, things like PEA days at the school boards, et cetera, um, just in terms of timing. Um, oftentimes people rely on the library on the day that it's a professional development day. So if that operational could, piece could be looked at, I, I'd be pleased to move it. I think it's great that this is going to occur. I think it's necessary. And in particular, as you said, given the amount of change that's occurred, um, stronger relationships and stronger clarity on expectations and team building is all incredibly valuable. No, I'm 99% sure we looked at all those options before we picked on the 23rd, um, but I will confirm, but I'm, I'm, I'm positive that we did, unless they changed something. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to take one second here, and I'm going to check the Halton School Board calendar, because they just yeah, approved it. Care if I may just, as you're doing that, it's a Friday, September 23rd is a Friday, happens to be the day after my birthday, which is how I know that. So it'd be un very unlikely it'd be a PA day. Is that because of your birthday or, or because it's a Friday? Well, perhaps both, but maybe some people celebrate my birthday and I don't know it, but um, no, we're clear. It's, it's a Friday. So, yeah. so, um, so Janet, I was thinking the same thing. It wouldn't interfere from what I can see. Yeah, I'm not seeing a Stephen Bright day on the calendar, nor am I seeing a PA day <laughs> on that particular day. So I think we're good. Well, that, that's clearly an error. <laughs> well, anyway. You should re take that up with your school board trustee. Um, okay, so that item has been moved. Uh, is there a seconder for that, please? Thank you, Susan. Um, just any comments or questions? My only comment is uh, I, there's no greater investment than an investment in our staff um, and their development. And this was a terrific, uh, I think we did it once successfully so yeah. far because of the last two years, as yep. Tara mentioned. I was there for a portion of it. I spoke to the staff and hung around for a bit. Um, and uh, it was, it was uh, very, um, it was great to see the whole team together in one place because they don't often work together, but yeah. seeing to get everybody in one place was great. And uh, I'm a big supporter of this initiative. Um, and I know it just benefits the public to no end. So thank you for um, moving and seconding it. Now I'm gonna call the vote and see if we've got support overall, all in favor. Looks like it's a done deal. So uh, that's approved and uh, you can move forward with your staff development day. Um, Stephen's available for um, uh, being serenaded on that day, by the way, just uh, in case you want to invite him. Uh, 6.5, CEO update. Yeah, we'll just wait for the presentation to come up. Okay. Um, so just a really quick COVID-19 update. This will likely be my last one in here unless something changes. Um, but there are no changes to COVID-19 regulations. Um, we're continuing to see high compliance to our strong recommendation um, that masking continue both in our facilities and our staff, we're both staff and, and customers, um, the majority of which are continuing to wear masks, which is lovely. Um, staff absences due to COVID have remained consistent and, and manageable. We've been quite lucky. Um, but we are seeing a rise in mental health incidents, particularly in the past few months. So that is something that we're keeping an eye on, um, as well as having discussions at the leadership level. We had a couple conversations with the um, um, 
uh, Joint Health and Safety Committee this, uh, this morning um, about what they're seeing and how we can help support and potentially do additional training or maybe some refresh training um, in order to be able to address uh, some of these issues. Um, next, just a quick update on North Park. Uh, the overall design is going really, really well. I have some updated plans. Not much has changed since what the board saw in March. Um, I will flag, um, should be unsurprising, I think that, that we're, we've identified that there's likely going to be some financial impacts to the global supply chain issues that we're seeing. Um, finance is reviewing some new estimates um, and identifying options for mitigation of those. Um, and a report is expected to go to council in June. Um, so as I get updates to that, I will of course bring them to the board. Um, so this is the bottom floor. There haven't been any significant changes um, to this area since the board saw it in March. Um, again, we continue to be really excited about it. Um, the uh, two information sessions that we held um, in March um, in conjunction with the town um, went really, really well. Um, one of the areas, one of the key things we heard about is, is places to come and read and relax, cozy spaces. Um, so we've, we kind of put an eye to that. That lower bottom um, next to the children's area is a seating kind of space. So we're looking at, um, when we go to look at furniture, you know, do we want to put a fireplace in there? Um, some different options to kind of create that cozy, of course, pending um, what the budget changes could potentially um, be. And then the upper floor, there's been one small change um, here, and that is we, we swapped the um, quiet study area and the photo cove, because um, it made sense to put the photo cove where it would not have windows. Um, and it made sense to put the study area where there would be windows. Um, so that uh, occurred to the team. So that, that swap, which makes it much easier to create that kind of like blackout area that you want for the video area. And then when you're studying, natural light um, definitely helps. So that's basically the only shift um, that's happened up there. You will also see the three meeting rooms that are up there um, in, in that space as well to accommodate um, independent work um, as well as small study groups. Um, so does anybody have any questions about North Park? Not seeing any, you can okay. proceed. Um, 16 mile relocation is next. Um, so I did mark it as yellow. It's mostly green. The reason it's yellow is that the timelines are still undefined. Um, so the tender uh, is out. It was scheduled to close on May 2nd. Um, however, uh, it does require a delay, so it will remain open for another week. Um, we will only be able to confirm timelines and budget once that tender closes and a contractor is assigned. So we do remain hopeful um, that we can start this project in June. Um, however, if all the contractors who bid on it come back and say, no, they can't start in June, um, then we'll have to, to shift. Um, so as soon as I have information on timelines, I'll be sure to update the board. Um, is there, what's happening with the uh, staff um, from 16 Mile while it's closed? So we will be um, redistributing them out. Um, however, we also are gonna host a 16 Mile pop-up library in the sports complex. Um, so some of the staff will, will, will work there as well as um, some of the other branches, particularly those that are busier in the summer. Um, so we do have a plan um, to ensure service con continuity um, in the community. Um, so 60 Mile Sports Complex has graciously allowed us to use their skate rental space on the lower floor. Um, I have a picture of that on the next slide. Um, services offered will be holds pickup, um, reference, um, there'll be staff there, so we'll be able to go in and talk about um, account query, uh, card registration, summer reading registration also included, a small browsing collections of uh, children's material and new adult materials, um, as well as access to our summer sports kits. Um, additionally, we are expanding, I think I might have mentioned this before, our OPL Express location that is in that building. We're expanding the number of lockers and we're adding in a browse and board kiosk. Um, and the reason for that is that the center itself has expanded hours. Um, so our pop-ups were looking to operate four times a week for four hours. Um, this is the current plan, but the OPL Express location with the Express locker pickup and the Browse and Borrow will be open the same hours as the center, um, which as you can see is 6 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. Um, 
uh, daily. So there are uh, significant options uh, for that community. Um, one thing you'll notice that isn't in here is, is programming. We're still trying to um, lock down programming options. It's a bit challenging because we're not sure what our exact timelines are, um, but I know the teams have reached out to um, local churches, local halls, and local schools just to see what's available. Um, we are looking at hosting our morning mover programs outside where we can, um, but also recognizing that having indoor space is um, important as well. Um, 60 Mile Sports Complex runs summer camps in the summer, so they don't have space for us, so we're just looking at alternatives in the community. Um, so I'll keep the board updated um, once we have timelines and once we start to solidify what programming will look like. Any questions on 16 Mile? Not seeing any. So are they, they're, we're not doing skate rentals at the moment, I guess, because of COVID. Is that the idea? They're not using it, no. Okay. So I don't know whether or not it's seasonal. I didn't know we actually rented skates there, so okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so just an update on the uh, Glen Abbey Art Project. The board will remember that I brought this up earlier in the year asking for uh, volunteers for the jury and thank you Susan and Bill for volunteering. Um, there's been a bit of delay because we've actually adjusted the scope. Um, so we adjusted the scope to create artwork both indoor and outdoor that connects. Um, for those of you who, who remember the um, children's area at Glen Abbey, there is significant empty wall space in that area. Um, so we thought if we were going to do this, why don't we create something really impressive and have it kind of bring that outdoor and indoor and make that connection in a way that'll be really fun for children. Um, it's also going to be the goal of this project to engage the community. So part of the art project is not just for an artist to create, um, but for them to engage the community as part of that creation process. Um, so it is a two-step process. So currently the request for expression of interest is out um, and those are due by June um, 12th. Shortlisted, the jury will then shortlist the artists and then they'll be paid to kind of um, create a conceptual proposal um, that the jury will then review. So more information um, to come with that, but I'm really, really excited about all the potential for that project. Janet, have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. There are no questions. Oh, I'm pretty sure Janet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't see Janet's hand. I apologize, Janet. I, you're teeny tiny right now, so I didn't see your hand. Sorry. Um, so I, just for clarity, we're giving them the 1500 to develop the concept. They'll, they'll have a future payment for delivering on the concept. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. The budget for the okay. overall, the full, for the full project is 50000 Okay, because I was going to say. Oh, no, that's just, we, we like, um, it is town um, policy to pay artists for, to create a concept, yes. Okay, thank you. I just, I, I thought you were paying them 1500 No, I, I should have put the full budget in there, my apologies. Okay. Hey, are there any further questions? I've now expanded my view again, so I can see everybody. Not seeing any, go ahead. Okay. Um, the citizen survey, so the councillors on the board would know this already because the citizen survey was announced on Monday, um, but every two years the town conducts a citizen survey to evaluate resident satisfaction with town's programs. Um, the library is excited to be third, um, again this year with a satisfaction rating of 87%. I'm going to have to figure out how we can compete with parks and waterfront. Um, although our story walks are on the waterfront, so I think we, we can claim some of that, right? Um, and then we're excited to get, my understanding is we're going to get ward by ward results um, in the coming weeks. So we'll be able to take a look at what the comments were based on satisfaction ward by ward um, and potentially look at trends and where we can make improvements for those specific wards. So more information will be coming to the board as we um, delve into those. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Um, and then finally, um, I think I've mentioned to the board uh, already that we're, we're introducing a community conversation series, um, really speaking to uh, pillar number four, um, which is how do we enrich lives and build healthy communities. And one of those ways is to create healthy dialogue um, on some you know, more challenging topics. And, and I think we're well placed to lead some of these discussions. Um, so it's a series of um, partner programs, events, and resources to engage the community in thoughtful conversations and discussions on social issues. Um, so this is just a, a rough guide for the rest of the year. Um, so in May, it's mental health and well-being. Um, June is uh, 2SLBTTQ 
IA plus, um, Indigenous Arts, Intellectual Freedom and Social Justice, which I'm quite excited about, and then November Belonging. Um, but just to highlight what's happening in May, um, we do have a number of, of, of conversations that are happening. Um, please feel free um, to share them or join in. We're really excited to see where some of these conversations can take us. Any questions? Janet has a question. Um, Tara, I pick up um, some of those uh, for the E newsletter, Councillor Giddings and I. But is it possible, like, uh, is it possible for um, library staff to like send out some of that to um, all of the councillors? I mean, this is, I mean, the reach of a councillor in terms of emails, etc., is pretty extensive now, uh, and uh, saving them the step by giving it to them means it gets inserted. Yeah, that's one of the things Joe and I have had um, a couple conversations on is, is creating a, a monthly newsletter to, to council that just kind of highlights what the library is doing. So you can expect to see that in the coming months. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Janet. It's a great idea. Stephen. 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 Um, sorry, I think you said me. I apologize. I I can't really hear you very well, but um, this is more just a point of information. I was on a go train the other day. First time I've been downtown in 15 months. That was yeah. kind of scary and fun. I listened to a podcast, which I'm going to share. It, it's a BBC History Extra, which I'm kind of addicted to. It was all about a new, a brand new book called, I'm looking at my phone here, The Library of Fragile History. And, and it, I, it's absolutely fascinating. I think people might find it interesting because there's a lot of books out there about the buildings. And Tara, I thought of you specifically for obvious reasons, but what you just said about the consultations, people want a place to sit. They're, the authors here talk about the books, not as much the buildings, but it's a fascinating story they weave through history. So I thought, I know we're all busy, but if you happen to be in the garden or going for a stroll, uh, it might be an interesting lesson because they, they do an excellent job of situating this contextually and then bring it up to the modern. Thanks, Stephen. Send us the link if you could. Stephen? I don't know why he doesn't seem to be hearing me. Can you hear me? Anybody, can, can anybody hear me? That's odd. Oh, I'm getting some thumbs up. Okay, well, anyway, you can hear me a little bit. Okay. Uh, members of the board, can I get a motion to uh, receive the CEO's update, please? Steve, uh, Andrew and Pankage, um, any comments, questions beyond what we've already had? All in favor? That's approved. Thank you very much. Members of the board, we do not have any confidential discussion items. Um, is there any new business to come before the board this evening? Uh, a couple pieces of new business. Janet, you go first. I can't, Janet, you're, pa you're muted. Um, it's National Volunteer Week. Um, I think you did an excellent job at Council reflecting um, broadly, but um, I know the library has very dedicated volunteers and I just, on a personal note, just wanted to express um, thanks and recognition. People's time is so uh, so tight nowadays. Finding time to volunteer is a, means a real commitment. And um, so to all the folks that are, are giving of their time to uh, the library, um, I think we're all very grateful. And that goes to all of our board who are all volunteers. So thank you. And you got your socks and chocolate today, I imagine. I saw Stephen uh, put it on social media already. You didn't get yours, Janet? Check your mailbox. Um, okay, uh, who's next? Uh, Andrew, was it? Yeah, Andrew. Um, I'm going to echo uh, Janet's thought there. Uh, thank you to our dedicated volunteers. And it's a nice segue as well. Um, the minutes mentioned that at tonight's meeting, we'd uh, get a recommendation on new board members to join us, but it was not on the agenda. Do we have an update on that? Yeah, so apparently that was my mistake. Um, due to the confidential information of people's personal information, it does not come to the board. Um, so the board has pre-approved a matrix. So I was provided the names and applications and resumes of all the applicants. Um, so I ranked them through the matrix um, and then um, they'll be going to council in May for approval. Okay. So apologies for the confusion. 
no, no worries. I, I thought it was their decision, but so I'm not overly disappointed. Thank you. <laughs> okay, members of the board, uh, that concludes uh, our business for today. I will uh, advise that our next board meeting is on Thursday, May 26 at 7 p.m. Um, right now it's virtual. Um, Tara will look into whether or not there will be an option for attendance. It'd be great to see you all if that's possible. Um, but beyond that, uh, looking for a motion to adjourn so we can go on with the rest of our evenings and enjoy our chocolate and socks. Bill and Susan, thank you very much. All in favor? And that's Carrie. Make sure you wear the socks and eat the chocolate, not the other way around. It can be confusing, <laughs> I know. Good night, everybody. Have a great evening, and we'll uh, see you soon. <laughs>